Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Club Metaverse podcast. I am joined today by Matthew Mungle, Academy Award winner uh, with over 250 film credits, one of the true legends of this industry. Matthew, thank you so much for joining us. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. Yeah, that's cool, man. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, Matt, uh, there's so many things I want to uh, sort of chat with you about because you are involved in probably one of the most well-known um, disciplines inside of the film industry, but perhaps one of the kind of more you know mysterious ones, right? It's not it's not one of the ones that gets the uh, you know documentaries or gets a ton of the shine, but it's the one that people always you know will talk about, you know, from the from like the early days of of seeing Al Pacino. Um, you know, with makeup on for the Godfather three or, 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 or star Wars or anything like that. Special yep. effects makeup has always been such an instrumental part of the craft. I, I'm very intrigued to know how, how you kind of got your start in, into this world. Well, you know, I, it's really weird because I was raised on a farm in Atoka, Oklahoma. It was uh -huh. a dairy farm. And so I was a farm boy. But I, from an early age, I learned to love horror movies. I just mm. love the Frankenstein, Dracula, Mummy, you know, all the black and white universal classic horror films with all those classic characters. And I'd, I'd, I'd have my sister stay up with me late at night to watch them because we were both scared and... <laughs> You know, it, I, I still have a picture of myself at five years old with a Aurora Dracula model in my hands. Oh, wow. So I, I must, it must have got in my blood early on. But I, I think the first thing that really caught my eye was, was um, um, there were two films. There was one, um, 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 Seven Faces of Dr. Lau, which okay. was incredible with uh, with um, uh, Tony Randall and William Tuttle did the makeup. I think he was given the first honorary uh, Oscar uh, for for the, his contribution to that film. And the other one was List of Adrian Messenger, where they had all these stars that pulled off their faces. Oh. And uh, Seven Faces of Dr. Lau, I watched it in the movie theater in Atoka, Oklahoma. And I was just amazed at how the actor became that character with makeup. And later I found out it was makeup. It was prosthetic makeup. Hmm. And that's way before special makeup effects and was Cohen, you know. So I just started doing it on my own. I was just gung ho, just, of course, as a kid, I'd go into, playing music and doing magic and stuff like that. But I always came back to makeup. I loved it. And then I went to, um, uh, I, I worked at a movie theater in the, the town of population 4,000 at Toka, Oklahoma. And I dress up like the Planet of the Apes. I dress up <laughs> as different characters just to promote films that were coming in. Right, and, cosplay before there was cosplay. And tell, tell me about it. And yeah. I'd do my own makeup. I'd make my own costumes. I just was a renaissance kind of kid right. that loved doing that. And, of course, a weird kid. And they'd call <laughs> me all these names and stuff like that. Ha, 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 ha shame on you now. Uh, anyway, so, <laughs> so um, I, I graduated from high school there, went to Oklahoma State University mm. immediately, um, 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 went to the theater department and majored in theater. Mm. And the scenic director, Jerry Davis, looked at my book that I put together, my little portfolio. And he, he looks at the book. He looks up at me, said, you did all this in high school? I said, yep, sure did. He said, well, my son, we're going to put you to work. And immediately the oh, first wow. play was Skin of Our Teeth by Thornton Wilder. Mm. And I think it was the and there were these costumes, a dinosaur and stuff like that. So I was right in there making costumes as a freshman, as a, as a, as a pre-freshman at Oklahoma State University. 
So um, two and a half years went by. I decided I got to move to Hollywood. I said, Dad, I got to move to Hollywood. I I got to see if I I need to do this. I need to see if I have what I it takes to become a makeup artist. And I registered at the Joe Blasco Makeup Center, which was and a wonderful school and uh, went there for two and a half months, two and a half, three months or something like that. And um, Joe really took me under his wing because he mm. saw that I loved what I did and I was passionate about makeup and learning everything. It was the first time in my life that I have had ever learned so much. I was like a sponge absorbing every little detail mm. of what would come in, you know, what we he had to teach and stuff. Immediately after I graduated from there, he put me to work teaching. So oh, wow. that really reinforced what I had learned. And it gave me a sense also this hick kid from Oklahoma, because very shy to work with people too. He knew exactly what he was doing. Mm. So he put me to work teaching other uh, students that came in and um, and he'd send me out on jobs here and there and it just snowballed from there. And these are jobs that he would send you on that were actually already film jobs? Uh, well, uh, they were film and commercials and stuff like that. You know, something right. that he knew I could handle. One of the jobs was he Orson Welles had come into him oh, wow. and said, I need a I need a nose for this project. And it was called Butterfly oh, with wow. Isadora and Stacy Keach. And so Joe, Joe said, OK, I'll do it for you. So he sculpted the nose and everything. He said he calls me up and says, Matthew, come on. We're going to go to Las Vegas. I got, I got this job. I go, oh, OK, no. I, I didn't know what it was. So he took me with him. We went to Orson Welles' house. Of course, we were royalty to Orson Welles. We went to Orson Welles' house. We went into his bathroom. He, Joe had set up all oh of his Lord. makeup stuff up there. And What year and, was uh, this, roughly? Circa what year? This was 1980, I believe. Oh, wow. 1980. Yeah. Yeah, 1980. And um, so we went into Orson Welles' bathroom. You know, it was a big, lush bathroom and stuff. Joe had set up and. Joe, uh, Orson Welles sits on the, the toilet or uh, <laughs> sits yeah. on a chair or something in there. Joe does the makeup, does the everything, and I watch intently. After he finished the makeup, he reached over and he pulled the nose off and he says, okay, clean uh, Mr. Wells up and you do the makeup. I said, okay. Wow. So I had been running the noses anyway before in foam latex. So I did the makeup. I did exactly what Joe did. And Orson looks in the mirror and goes, good job, son. So Joe says, okay, I'm leaving. I'm going back to LA and you're going to do the, the show. You know, he only worked about three or four days. He played a judge or something on the, the show. Oh, so you were there with him uh, for the for the span of those three or four days working with Orson Welles. Uh, yeah. And it wasn't until then, until I told my parents about that, that they really realized that I was serious about what I wanted to do because right. Orson Welles was their generation. Of course. I mean, Orson Welles was, you know, many, many credit to him as the, as the, you know, as the progenitor of, of the medium, you know, um, exactly. And the makeups that were done on him by Maurice Snyderman, I believe it was on citizen cone, uh, citizen Kane, sorry, uh, yeah. was, I did citizen cone too. Was amazing for the time. It, was, it, it really you know, was. He was what? 24 years old. It was gorgeous makeups. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and Maurice didn't get enough credit for that, really. I mean, of all the stuff that he did, I, I think it was Maurice Sediman. Um, I may be wrong, but it, it just beautiful makeups. Just and, and what, one thing that I'm intrigued by, because uh, one time I, I actually, for a project that I was working on, I had a plaster thing done of my face. And, and 
And it's quite the intimate uh, um, experience between you and the person who's applying the plaster and, and putting the holes in the nose and making sure you can breathe. I mean, you're quite vulnerable, right? Because you have to stand still while there's this mm -hmm. other human being sort of hovering over you for an extended amount of time. While you were sort of doing this with the legend that is Orson Welles, was there any kind of dialogue that has stuck with you since those days? Any kind of little nuggets that Orson threw at you? Or, or was he more of a quiet fellow? He, he, was, he was a very quiet person. I, unfortunately, really unfortunately, didn't know that much about Citizen Kane at that at the, point. Right, sure, In my sure. career, in my young life. You know, I was 21, 22 years old. Right, right. I, I, my, my world revolved around prosthetics and monsters and stuff like that, mm. kind of blood and gore stuff and just learning the craft. So I was so intent on making that move, that makeup great on him that that's all I thought about, you know, yeah, which, yeah. which made me good for him at that point. And I, I think I'm sure he answered so many questions about Citizen Kane. And sure, yeah. I, I don't know if he would have uh, offered that stuff up or anything, but I'm I do kick myself now not not to get into it with him. I mean, but look, it, it, it's you know, it might even be better the way that you experienced it because it was more pure, right? It was just yeah. you and pure, total pure, pure. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, so about seven years later from this point, you get to work on what I would consider to be one of your sort of more mainstream uh, gigs and one that seems to be right in line with the passions that 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 you have, which is A Nightmare on Elm Street uh, 3. Um, by this point, you had already done like 10 or 15 movies, right? Yeah. The, yeah. And, and interesting that you bring that up because I only did like two gags on that. Oh, that those films, they had so many makeup effects on it. There would be, they'd hire five or six labs to do certain things on that film. And so people bring that up. And I said, well, I only did. I only <laughs> impaled John Saxon. Right. <laughs> you know, on the back and then made this dead cat. And I think that's all I did for that show. Right. So right, right. I, there are so many others. I got involved with Jeff Obrow and Steve Carpenter early in my career. Joe, they had called the, the studio, the, the makeup school. And I had already been teaching there about a year or something like a year or two. And Joe recommended me because they were still students at uh, USC mm. and or UCLA, sorry, UCLA. Right. And um, uh, so I went to meet with them and they said, well, we're doing this. We're putting this 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 trailer together to do uh, a little vignette movie, 10 minute movie to show that what we want to make a full length movie out of. Right. And so I said, yeah, I'd, I'd do it. You know, just pay me, pay me, you know, materials and I'll do it. That's well, awesome. we did it and everything. They got the funding. They got the, the film to do. So that led to the dorm that drip blood, a.k.a. pranks, a.k.a. whatever else it was called. And right. Then, and then that led to um, uh, the power which they did as their second movie, I think. And then that third movie was the big movie, which was The Kindred. Oh, and the kindred. that was fun. That was fun. I had done the little trailer for them and done a monster for it. And at that point, and, and this goes to all of those young makeup artists out there, learn your strengths and weaknesses. Mm. I knew that I didn't have the strength to do big monsters or things like that. I wanted to do subtle things, subtle prosthetics, a little over the top, maybe here and there. But I decided for the film, I wanted to do makeup effects. So I said, Jeff, Steve, 
you need to call Mike McCracken Sr. and his son Jr., Mike McCracken Jr., they're going to do a great job on the creature. And I want to take care of all the makeup effects, which okay, there so, were, were a lot of. So, so as somebody who's, you know, I'm, I'm a film buff. I, you know, went to NYU film school. I, I've, I've run media companies. So I, I'm quite familiar with it, but I'm not so familiar with all the intricacies that you're describing in these disciplines of makeup, you know, effects. Right. Uh, you know, because typically if you tell somebody, you know, makeup effect, you're really thinking about something that's like limited to the face, right? You're not really thinking about like creatures or monsters or stuff like that. Can can you give me kind of like a little makeup effect for idiots breakdown of like kind of like what the silos are? Sure, absolutely. And it's not for idiots. It's just, you know, <laughs> right. it's, it's cool. Don't, don't, don't yeah. demean, demean yourself that way. Don't, sure, don't go sure. down that road. So, you know... Going back to my career, early in my career, I said I never want to limit myself to mm. doing one thing. There are people out there that only do monsters. There are people out there that only do old age stuff. I said I want to do it all. Right. I'm going to have a bigger career if I do that. So by setting up a lab and taking all the jobs I could, just to do lookalikes, just to do a nose on somebody, just to do blood and gore, whatever it took to keep me working constantly, I would. Right. So, so when when a producer would call, they'd say, "Well, we need these, and we need to come you to come in and interview." You know, and I took my portfolio and say you know, what do you need? And we'll give you the script and here's a breakdown of what we need. And we'll go through it. And because I started out my career working on my own, mm -hmm. doing all these little small jobs, I learned from my mistakes mm -hmm. and my triumphs. And I learned what was, what worked and what didn't work. And I think, I think those producers and directors really saw it in me one that I really loved and had a passion for what I did. Right. Which is so And important. also that I knew my shit. Right. So, right. That I knew how to do stuff. You sure. Know? And, and so and, go ahead. And it also seems, cause I think it's important that you came into it with one preconceived notion, but you didn't let that kind of limit your boundaries and you kind of almost invented the medium as you went by kind of redefining it to your strengths. Absolutely. You have to understand that I got to Hollywood in December of 1977. That was the beginning, mm. the, pen, the the start, the little start there of makeup effects as we know it now. Right. Until then, it was just called prosthetics. And as a makeup artist, you did everything and stuff like that. And I really learned from Joe Blasco. He said, never limit yourself. Always be able to do beauty makeup, a beard, whatever they need you to do, you do it. And you're going to get more jobs and you're, you're going to love what you do more. Right. And did I answer your question? Yeah, yeah. No, because um, you did. Because what the, the fascinating thing about the answer um, that I think resonates with me the most is that, you know, um, you started out thinking about A, but during the process, we're able to kind of, you know, prove yourself in B, C, D, E, and F. And then as you were doing this, the entire industry kind of molded itself around that mm -hmm. um, and kind of had that expectation of other kind of makeup effects uh, people to to be able to do that kind of wide variety of you know of of things on on screen which yeah it's just fascinating because it's it's such an integral part of the filmmaking process and and I have to say it's not one that a lot of people kind of know too much about you know it, no it, it's it, it's so creative I mean hmm. it's so creative one of the biggest comps compliments that I could ever have given to me 
by an audience member or a person that saw a film is that I had no idea that they were wearing, pro that actor was wearing prosthetics. Now right. that, you know, you've done your job and you've done it well, you know? Yeah, um, the the invisibility of art is is always something that people strive for, you know, right? When, mm -hmm. when, when you can't see the cut, is what an editor wants to hear, you know, when you, right. when you don't see the acting, that's what the actor wants to hear, you know, when that's you don't right. see the special effects, that's what the special effects guy wants to hear. Um, right. and, and, you know, as your career, because I mean, your career is just amazing. I, like all of this work, I don't know how one human being can do this, <laughs> but by, by, by the point where you do, um, dirty rotten scoundrels in 88, which is right after the uh, nightmare on Elm street stuff. Um, was that, you know, first of all, I love that movie. That's kind of why I'm going to that, you know, to that movie. Um, but Steve Martin, uh, were you on location for the entire shoot? Were you dealing with them on a daily basis? Okay, so 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 let let, let me backtrack and tell you a little bit of, of leading up to that story. Please, that, please. That film. In in August, I believe it was August of 1987. I was, I was called by a producer who I was referred to by another makeup artist. And the producer, his name was Bernie Williams. Mm. Now, he had been a uh, Stanley Kubrick's first AD on Barry Lyndon and Clockwork Orange, I believe, and oh, stuff yeah, like that yeah, in yeah, England. Yeah. And then he moved to, to, to the United States to become a producer. Well, he had produced a few films for Orion, and uh, it came up that he needed a makeup artist department head to do a film he was doing in Montana called War Party. Mm. So, so I should sure I went in to meet with him and everything else, and um, uh, got the film, did the film. We got along. It, it was a rocky road at, at the beginning it, for me to learn his idiosyncrasies and how. Sure you approach his way of filmmaking and you know how how you approach him but after that apparently he liked what i did because in later years i think we worked on seven more films together right so right. that means there was a great a working relationship with there anyway yeah. the next film he was doing was dirty Brown scoundrels directed by the incomparable Frank Oz, who right. I absolutely adore as a director and a person. He's just the, an amazing human being. Anyway, so uh, um, uh, Bernie said, I need you to go talk to Frank about this one effect that we need done in Dirty Rotten Scoundrels. And so I met Frank at the Four Seasons or something, one of the hotels in Beverly Hills. Mm -hmm. And he had just finished or just got off of they had been released the little shop of horrors of course right. we had to talk about that first right, I was just, that, that's amazing oh, yeah, God, yeah, that's yeah. So, amazing. so he said well this is just we just need i need i need michael kane to hit him on the shins with a, a, a stick you know and i don't want yeah, obviously we got to protect Steve and, and all that stuff like that. And, and so I'm thinking, well, maybe we need to do, he said, maybe we need to do fake legs and stuff like that. I said, you know what? No, let's not limit it that way. Frank, let's, let's, let's think about this a little bit more. Why can't I do a prosthetics that's really thin hair punched in it that has a piece of fiberglass in between him and that. And, you can shoot it all the way around and all that stuff. And, and you can move the, the, the pants up and down. He said, love it. Let's do it. Let's do it. So, so I called Bernie back. We said, yeah, it was great. It was great. Okay. I need to cast Steve's legs. So he flew me to New York. I met Steve on a Sunday morning at the Mayfair cool. Hotel. He came up to my room and <laughs> and I did a, just a plaster bandage cast of his legs after wrapping them in in plastic as he read the New York Times, you know. Right, right. And these sometimes the the comedians most of the time, you know, 
one on one, very low key. And that's right. exactly the way Steve was. He didn't hardly talk very much. I was very professional with him. It was like, okay, we're going to do this, 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 and I'm going to make these, and, you know, this is what I'm going to make it for your legs, and you'll never feel anything and stuff like that. He said, okay, great. So I did the cast, came back to L.A., started making the pieces, and after I was making the pieces, I got another film, too, and it was quite a few months before I was going to go to Nice, France to do the film. Right. So I took a film called Monster High, which had a ton of monsters in it and stuff like that and just kind of goofy aliens and monsters and stuff. So I was doing that as well as prepping Dirty Rotten Scoundrel stuff. So I think at the last minute, I got all the Dirty Rotten Scoundrel stuff left, finished finished Monster High, took off to Nice, France, had the had the legs in tow and everything. And uh, Michael Bauhaus was oh, shooting wow. the film. Oh, one of the greatest cinematographers so, ever. Exactly. Yeah. And that's the first time I'd worked with Michael. I ended up working with Michael about four or five times after that, especially on Bram Stoker's Dracula. Sure, sure. We're going to get to that, of course, because that's the full circle of your of your life. Oh, my God. Yes. So anyway, I uh, put the legs on. I said, uh, you know, costume department's got to make sure there's a silk lining to the, the pants. So when it comes up, it doesn't pull out the hairs and everything. And it went off without a hitch. Everybody loved it. And that is one of the you watch that film and you watch that little vignette of that those two actors together it is so freaking funny yeah so one thing that i got to ask yes uh, when 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 you were working with frank oz did at any point did he bust out the yoda voice i'm sure everybody asks you that okay so i ended up working with him on what about bob and indian in the cover and stuff everything every time frank opened his mouth was either Yoda came out or Fozzie Bear came out <laughs> or or every or Piggy whatever <laughs> you would hear that he wouldn't normally just do that but that was it right. that was Frank's Oz voice you know right and did you ever get um called or or use your Frank Oz connection or maybe get on the Star Wars films or no 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 because yeah. that was done in England. I never in my career used a producer or somebody to get on a film. I always cool. relied on them to call me. They That's have to call interesting. Me first. So just on the virtue of your work. Just on the virtue of my work. And I was always known for getting in there, doing the job, and leaving. Right. I was never <laughs> smoozing. I was never doing, oh, what's the next job you got? No, nope. just go and do your job, keep those visors on, do a great job, and leave. So, and I'm there. sorry, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. No, 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 that's fine. So, so one um, one movie that it seems to me, and I and please, you know, I apologize if I'm getting this incorrectly, but that's okay. uh, the the first movie that I see you here as makeup department head which is actually a movie that not a lot of people know about, but for whatever reason, it was a movie that I was really into as a kid uh, because it kind of came from this sort of Dom Simpson uh, high concept school that, you know, started with Top Gun and stuff like that. And the movie with, with, um, with uh, uh, Charlie Sheen, Michael <laughs> Bean, Navy Seals, Navy Seals. And, and, and it was one of these silly movies, but for whatever reason at the time, it was such a, a zeitgeisty moment, you know, yep. and yep. Uh, this was this actually your first um, job as the head of the entire department? No, it was War Party. Oh, OK. Was, well, actually, before that was Split Decision, a.k.a. Kid Gloves, a boxing right. <laughs> film. That was the first. And then the second was uh, War Party. And then the third was uh, Navy SEALs. And as we were finishing, as we, they were still shooting, we, uh, Bernie Williams took me out to dinner in Nice, France, while we were working on Dirty Run Scoundrels. He said, you know what? I got this another film coming up called Navy Seals and stuff like that. And in my mind, it was like a, a film about seals and stuff like <laughs> that. I didn't know what the Navy Seal was. And so, right. you know, I just kind of let it go and stuff like that. 
about a couple of months later, uh, Bernie calls me and said, okay, I'm getting ready to do Navy SEALs. You want to come? And I, I said, sure, let's, let's do it. Let's do it. So that was another Bernie Williams film I did. That's cool. um, and uh, the great John Alonzo shot that. And mm. I had just finished before I went on Navy SEALs with John Alonzo shooting The Guardian with William Friedkin who oh, wow. I absolutely adored too. I thought going into the Guardian and the and working with William because I'd learned some, heard so many horror things about him. But boy, we got along great because I guess again he knew that I was focused. I loved what I did. I was eager to please him, whatever he wanted. And it was a great working relationship with William Friedkin. And. And what was Charlie Sheen like back in those days? Because that was like at the peak of his career, right? Like he had already come <laughs> off of Wall Cut Street. Two. Yeah, yeah. You're like, like how? Uh, uh, full of vim and vigor. It was just let's just say that. Because <laughs> he was he a young guy, Michael then. Bean. <laughs> right? Him and Michael Bean. I mean, these are two of the legends of our of our industry, and like. They were at their peak at that point, you know. What whether the movie was what, a huge success or not, this? right? <laughs> Michael, B. <laughs> because you did, did you work closely with both of them, like, uh, or, uh, or were you well, managing I a put, team at that uh, point? Lynn Egan, who had worked on, uh, became we came became friends on Split Decision and Kid Gloves, and uh, she went, uh, she was my second on War Party, and then we went on to, to Navy SEALs. Her and Teresa Austin were there with me. And I put uh, uh, Lynn on to doing uh, uh, Charlie's makeup and all the girls' makeups. And uh, I did Michael Bean and some of the other guys on the show. So Lynn really took care of Charlie, except for the special stuff I'd, I'd go in and do. But, um, yeah, they were uh, they were young. Right. <laughs> and... And now jumping ahead a few years, yeah. um, or actually just one year, is probably the movie that has had, I think, the most lasting influence on the concept of makeup in general. And I'm I'm really intrigued to know what 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 your role was in that, or 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 how you interacted with that movie. But obviously, Edward Scissorhands um, and working with Tim Burton, Johnny Depp, and and like. That movie and Edward Scissorhands himself is probably the the epitome of what became goth and what became such a, a kind of a visual lexicon of how the face can express color and paint and all that kind of stuff. I mean, such a, a monumental moment. I think it's in makeup in in, in movies. What what was that like? Were you amongst many people working on it? Were you was well? I had just finished Navy SEALs and 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 we'd finished it in Spain. And then I I um I, I met my friend John Jackson there, my partner, and we went on to Europe and stayed uh, in London for a little while. And then I came back and did a few things about. Um, the end of March, 1990, I get a call from uh, V. Neal, who I already knew, but I hadn't worked with her before. And uh, we knew each other and I was always friendly to her and she, vice versa. She said, say, Matthew, listen, uh, I really need you to come down and join me on this film. It's called Edward Scissorhands and we're shooting down in Tampa. I thought I could I thought I could rely on the, the person I hired as my second, but she doesn't really do prosthetic. She's a good, uh, strong beauty girl mm. and, and uh, I'll still use her, but I need somebody that's fast and can help me put Johnny's makeup on. I said, I'm there. The right. only thing is that I had just gotten my union hours to get into the union and back on the guardian, mm. the, the previous year and i was waiting to take my union test and taking all my classes she said hold on one, one second i'll call you right back she called uh howard smith the business rep said howard and v v was really well known by that time in the union mm -hmm. and she said he, he said 
She said, Howard, I, I want to use Matthew. I hear he needs to take his test. He, she, he said, okay, V, not, not a problem. Just tell him, make sure, and it was a union film, uh, make sure he comes back and takes his test. And, and, and it's fine. And she calls me back and she said, done. Uh, I want you to get on the plane uh, in tomorrow and come down to Tampa. And that was April the 1st, 1990. Wow. I was on that plane. Two weeks later, I had to fly back during the weekend to take my union test and then fly back to be there on Sunday night to work on Monday morning. So working on Edward Scissorhands is one of my highlights of my career. I, mm. I had a blast. V was great. It was wonderful working with Johnny Depp and, and Winona Ryder, who later I walked on to Bram Stoker's Dracula and we go, <laughs> oh, that's cool. That's it's cool. Like, such, a, ah. such an incredible actor. What, what on a oh, writer, absolutely. Right? So, so no, it, and working with Tim Burton, you know, hot, humid Tampa, Florida, every day Tim Burton was in black. So right. I don't know, whatever, long sleeves, <laughs> everything. He was great to work with. It was such a great film to work on. And then, of course, we come back to L.A. and do about two or three weeks with uh, uh vincent price and that was the whole film was just it and, was a fairy tale it was and, uh, what can i say it was a dream come true for me yeah such a such a legendary piece of cinema and oh. what what one thing that I, I i'm i'm kind of intrigued by is the from from the concept of who edward scissorhands was to the execution of what he looked like was there um, a lot of iteration was there pretty much had they figured it out on paper and you kind of had to mimic the storyboard type of thing. Like what was that sort of process like to get to the final result? Well, V had already worked with Tim and won an Oscar for Beetlejuice. Right. Which is, you know, two years before. Right, so right. they knew each other. They were, they were like this. They knew right. they were yin and yang. And, that concept of, of Edward Scissorhands of, of Johnny's look came from Tim Burton. He drew that dark around the eyes. If you look at all of Tim Burton's characters, they always have that dark eyes around. Sure, them. yeah, yeah. But that, but then, then um, V took that and added her beautiful magical touch to it, and and just just made it beautiful so by the time i i got there they'd only only been shooting about a week mm. and she'd only done the film uh only done the makeup about two or three times and she was doing it from a polaroid you know doing all of the the pieces together i go and this is when my training of of low budgets and everything i said v you know could could we ask Stan's people to make a vacuum form of of, Stan of Johnny's Winston? face, a vacuum form plastic of his? And when you face. say Stan, you mean Stan Winston? Stan or? Winston, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. He's Sorry. been on the show. He's <laughs> been on the Winston. show as yeah, yeah. He's been on the show as well. Yeah, Stan Winston. God bless yeah, yeah. His soul. yeah. Um, and uh, uh, people to make a vacuum form of his face, and we'll cut it in half. Uh, once we do the makeup, we'll you know, mark all the, the, the cuts and everything. And then that way we've got a stencil every day. She said, Oh, that's, that's a great idea. So we did that and it cut the makeup in half wow. doing it. And she'd finish around the eyes and luckily she's left-handed. I'm right-handed. It was just a perfect. And you guys would actually do it together. You guys would work on. The oh yeah. We do it together. We do wow. it together. So after the second or time doing it, we, it would just be, we turn around. Oh, it's, done and we didn't even know we did it did it because it was it was done it and, was like clockwork you know so. and the muscle memory of uh, of applying that kind of legendary iconic makeup is that something that stays with you to this day like if you had to put yeah. edward Absolutely. scissor hands on your nephew or whatever for halloween you could you could win a win a contest with it it just it'd be, absolutely it'd be, that's awesome absolutely that's absolutely. awesome um the yeah, no, no, that just blows my mind, especially because they've like once I look at all the kind of the highlights that you know that I had picked out here, it's like, you know, you've worked with literally some of my heroes, and that same year, or no, the year after that, you got to work with Barry Levinson and Warren Beatty, who I think are two of the most fascinating 
people, you know, that, that, that era of cinema gave us, you know, uh, yep. you know, what, what was, because Bugsy, that was one of these movies where if I'm not mistaken, it's been a long time since I watched that movie, but in that movie, there was a little bit of a time passage with the main character starting off fairly young and then right. becoming the kind of grizzled old, you know, uh, you know, mafioso that he became. Was that something that you got to work pretty closely with Warren Beatty on? No, actually, I only did Harvey Keitel's makeup on that. Oh, wow. Okay, yeah, yeah, I did, yeah. Uh, I was brought in, uh, a makeup artist had started it, and he had to go on another show, and um, he was, uh, and he'd only done the makeup about two times. And I came in, and I did that makeup in less than half the time that he did it, and you know, it's just our, just the way we work, you know, just this streamline, you know, I love to, to, to do a makeup really fast and touch it up on the set if I have to, because <laughs> I know that the actor has to continue and do his job. Right. You right. Know, it's not all about us. It's about his face on the screen. Right. So that that's always been in here for me. Uh, so, so I went on and, Funny story about that. Uh, yeah. Two years before or a year and a half before, uh, of course, Warren Beatty was just right off of Dick Tracy. so right. Which he directed uh, as well. I, yeah. I believe Gordon Willis was a cinematographer on that yes. one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But right before he started Dick Tracy, I was asked by another makeup artist who I'd worked with all, my, all the time doing prosthetics, Marie Stein, he got a call to do some print ad for Ishtar. Oh, God, another Wonderful. one of my favorite movies. Everybody <laughs> hates that movie, but I love that so, movie. So he said, we've got, to go to, we've got to go to New York and do a face cast of Il Isabel Ajani. Of course, Warren was going with Isabel Ajani. Sure he time. was. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> they put us up in the, uh, the, the Ritz-Carlton. Uh, Warren Beatty was in a suite up at the top. Maurice and I went up to set up and uh, Warren comes in and says, hi, how you doing? And um, uh, I said, Maurice, I forgot something down at the room. Uh, not intentional, but I just forgot, you know. So Maurice went down to get it. At that point, Warren and I started talking. I said, yeah, I do prosthetics all the time. He said, you know what? I'm doing a film uh, really soon and I'd like for you to come and interview with me and stuff. It's called Dick Tracy. And I go, Okay, right. <laughs> uh, I don't have my portfolio here, but I'll. So when we got back to LA, I went to to interview for Dick Tracy and had met Warren Beatty already. So uh, I didn't get the job, of course. But uh, when we were on the set of Bugsy, uh, that's when he and uh, um, uh, Annette Benning started dating. And Warren was like, oh, Matthew, how are you doing? You know, what Matthew and I met. It's like, so it was like serendipity, you know, yeah, yeah, all yeah, those that's things, awesome. how they work, you know. Yeah. But just working on um, uh, Harvey Keitel was, was great. He was, he was a, he'd fall asleep as I was doing the makeup, wake up. Oh, you're finished? Okay, great. Looks great. Yeah, yeah. Harvey, Harvey Keitel, Barry Levinson, he's just, just some yeah. legends. And, and then you have like this amazing streak here. Um, single white female, great movie, Citizen Con. To be honest with you, that one I haven't seen. That you yet. should watch that, it is amazing. It's about Roy Cohn and uh, his dirty deeds in New York. And James Woods does an amazing acting job. Yeah, that. James Woods is a good actor, he is a, definitely a good actor. But then the next one is a movie that I've probably seen maybe 15 20 times. I absolutely love this movie. And this is the one that actually got you an Academy Award. Um, and also kind of going back to how we started this conversation, you holding that statue of Dracula in your hand as a five-year-old uh, and then getting to work on Bram Stoker's Dracula directed by Francis Ford Coppola, um, you know, Keanu Reeves and Winona Ryder. And of course, of course, Gary Oldman. This was a great movie. It, in a movie that I think holds up to this day uh, as a very, very good gothic uh, telling of like the kind of yeah. true novelized version of Bram Stoker's Dracula. 
a yeah. very, very cool movie that I think is a little underappreciated. But at the time, it wasn't. At the time, it was a very big deal. And it still is to, I think, the film buffs to this day. But what was that like, being able to sort of not only do all of these things that you wanted to do as a child, but then to get so much recognition and acclaim for it? Uh, uh, another dream come true. I mean, wh what can I say? I mean, it's true Hollywood, you know? Uh, I was hired by Greg Canham to do the on-set application every day uh, for Gary Oldman. Greg would come on every once in a while, uh, most of the time, and uh, we'd apply the makeup together. Greg would leave, and I'd stay there all day, and, and over and over and over again. And again, I had worked with the first AD, Peter Giuliani, on War Party, and then Bugsy. So mm -hmm. we knew each other going into the film. So it was a match made in heaven there. I'd nice. already worked with uh, Michael Bauhaus, you know. Uh, I'd already done What About uh, um, Dirty Ron Scoundrels and What About Bob with my, Michael. So, and all of his crew. So it was it was a match made in heaven. It was, it was glorious, to tell you the truth. And Winona Ryder. I, and then Gary Ullman, what can I say? He's just a oh brilliant my God. That, guy. That an actor that that makeup to this day blows my absolute mind because Gary Oldman when he was when he filmed that movie was a was a young man you know he was I'm not sure exactly how old he was but I'm gonna guess maybe 30 maybe less you know like I think so yeah, yeah. and when you first meet Count Dracula the the older version at the beginning of the movie, when 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 uh, Keanu Reeves goes up there to like talk about his real estate dealings or whatever you know the setup is, yep. this looks like an old man. Like you have, there is talk about invisible makeup. There is yep. no question yep. that this is a very ancient human being. And that that scene where uh, Dracula comes to his room. And starts shaving him, and then licks the oh, licks the the razor. That was the first day of shooting with him in that makeup. That's incredible. That's incredible. <laughs> and I know exactly where I was during that shot. Where, where were you? I, you got to share with me. I was just right outside the door, and, right. and right outside the door. But of course, one of the walls was was a moving wall that. Francis really wanted this to be like Nosferatu, like mm. uh, uh, Beauty and the Beast, the Cocteau Beauty and the Beast, all of those movies wrapped up in one where you saw things, but you didn't really see them. It didn't have really any visual effects or CGI that we know of today in it. Rotoscoping, everything was done in camera. Um, right, uh, Francis' right. son would do second unit. I would be going back and forth doing hand makeups. And I think I did the hand makeups, you know, 30 times or something. And just, it was an incredible creative time uh, during that movie. Uh, I, I just. Did you get to keep one of the prosthetics of Gary Oldman's face? I, I do have one of those. Yeah. See, Greg would block it out. And then Mitch Devane, put his beautiful skin on doing the rest of the sculpt before it was molded. And uh, it, it was really Mitch Devane's beautiful work. And Glenn Hans on the back creature and the, and the, the every, it just beautiful work. Just beautiful yeah. work. And yeah. Because I, now you just uh, reminded me that somehow Francis Ford Coppola didn't want to use traditional special effects at the time. He yeah. wanted everything yeah. to be, Old done school. In, yeah 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 and if you look at the film now it's you know even the scene where he becomes that vampire that sort of full size vampire it's that it's was thrown in at kind of the last minute greg said oh let's do <coughs> let's do a, a bad creature you know yeah and, and what did it feel like you know because every kid who's ever wanted to make a movie dreams of that moment where you get the ultimate recognition and you got that you know golden statue what was that whole experience like i did not get into this business thinking i i i'm, I'm gonna win an oscar I, mm -hmm. that's my ultimate goal i got into this business because i love it 
I'm passionate about it. And it was just one of the icings on the cake. I mean, it was the most amazing. I had broken my leg on heaven and earth uh, a few months, uh, a month before, and I got my cast off the week before the oh, Oscars. Wow. Oliver Stone's and, Heaven and Earth. Yeah, Heaven and Earth. I worked with him twice. Natural Born Killers, Oliver, you know, all that. Yeah, stuff. another masterpiece but, in my opinion. I just, you know, it was amazing walking up on that stage just with the biggest grin on my face. <laughs> the thing that really made my made tears in my eyes was when I won that immediately when I won the Oscars. My mom and dad were sitting watching it in a Toko, Oklahoma. The API, a reporter from API Associated Press, calls my dad, phone rings, says, Gene Mongol, yes. Well, your son just won the Oscar. What do you what <laughs> you know, what do you what do you have to say? You know, they say, like, Well, you know, I have three sons. Matthew's the youngest. Um, he, he's the, the last of you know the sons. Uh, but tonight he's number one. Oh, that's and nice. it, I, he, my, my dad passed away uh, in September of that same year. But oh, in wow. August, I went back with my Oscar for him to see it, my mom and dad. So that was right there. Priceless. You know, what can I say? Yeah, that's, that's, that's heavy. Um, yeah. and, and, you know, this, this happened you know what um dracula came out in 90 what year he came it? out in 92 and so we won the oscar in march of 93 and so this was only maybe I was what 37 i think i was 37 years old that's incredible and this is only the first third of your career you know which is like the thing, you know, we we we're we're almost out of time here. We're only at the first third. Oh it's my like gosh! Your, your career is we'll, like a we'll have to do privilege. this again because I could absolutely we could we could continue on this anyway. So so beginning this, uh, winning that Oscar, and then I won an Emmy that same year for Citizen Kong for oh, James, nice. with James Woods. So I, I think I I hold that honor. Hopefully, I don't know. Anyway, um, <laughs> but I I you know. I never put my laurels on th these awards. I won the awards. I can charge all this stuff. I kept my head down. I went in. I did the job. I got out. And yeah. I'd accept any jobs that I could. And that's what made my career. And you know? it's amazing because if you look at your body of work, it seems that that philosophy, typ typically when people find the philosophy that works for them, it's got a kind of a half-life, right? Like, it, it works, and then whatever happens, you you get complacent, and then it kind of peters off. But it seems like you've maintained that. You know, there, there's so many incredible credits even after that. One that I have to mention because it was such a big deal in the news um, was you working on uh, the Irishman, um, and this just happened fairly fairly recently. And, yeah. You know, uh, again, I, I I only made prosthetics for Robert De Niro and kind of kind of consulted with his makeup artist uh, Carla White on that. And uh, but it it was again a legend, you know. What yeah. can I say? And, and was these prosthetics to make him look younger? Were were, were these part of? Yeah, the they things? they knew they were going to do a lot of digital. So, uh, you know, I made some pieces for Carla to make him look a little younger and then digital took it the rest of the way. Yeah. And, and like, how, how do you, how do you go about like doing that? Do you have them molded? Do you have resources like outsourcers that do all the technical side of the molding and stuff? like yeah, that? Yeah. I, I mean, I was, I was working from here in Austin and, uh, um, I had, I, I know, a lot of makeup artists, they know me and stuff, a prosthetic artist. And so I got somebody I knew in New York to do a face cast of Robert, a new one, uh, of Bob, as mm -hmm. he likes to be called. And he uh, so he sent me that for future and, uh, with a lot of pictures. So I just analyzed it and see what we needed. And Carla and I talked and, you know, he's got big eye bags. So we're going to cover that up and we're going to put lifts on him. 
pull his neck, you know, so you, you get get rid of all this. <laughs> right. Just by a piece of tape in the back. That's it. Look how much younger I look. <laughs> so uh, you don't need any digital for that. So, you know, it's it's magic. So I, um, first of all, uh, God, I have so many, uh, you know, questions and thoughts. Um, let's do it again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's do it again. One, one thing, um, but I, oh, this is what I wanted to ask. There's two yeah. things. Number one, do you still sometimes dress up like you used to as a child when you would go to the movie theaters and maybe go to a Comic-Con in disguise as this kind of world class, uh, you know, makeup yeah. artist that's invisible in the crowd because they can't even tell it's you? Uh, do, do you ever do that still? You know, I get this question all the time. No. No, right. Because you know what? It's Halloween year round for me. <laughs> I can do whatever I want, you know. Yeah, yeah. And that's and by by semi retiring and taking about three years off and doing small jobs and moving to Austin, I, I think I'm wanted now more than ever, you know, yeah. because I'm just kind of recluse and I'll make stuff days on the set. No, nah, I don't do that anymore. Because you don't live in Los Angeles, right? You live no, somewhere I live in, the in Austin. Of the country. Little town called Laga Vista near Austin, Texas. Oh, keep Austin weird. I got weird. a studio here. You're I the got one that keeps old Austin police weird. Station. Yeah, yeah. Old police station. I turned into a studio. I'm I'm good buddies with Robert uh, Rodriguez, and uh, oh. he he turned an entire airport into yep. a studio yep. in Austin. Yep. it's one of the sure most did. magical places you've ever seen because it's like sure this gigantic piece of land, Perfect. and only and only like four people work there. Is this, I worked on I worked on that lot, uh, on uh, on a with uh, Edward Norton. Oh, nice uh, for twenty uh, sixth hour or 20, 25th hour uh, mm. before Robert Rodriguez got it. I think. Oh wow! So yeah, yeah. Uh, anyway, I yeah, yeah. hey, we can pick up right after Bram Stoker's Dracula. <laughs> Yeah, definitely, definitely. I, I will take you up on that. And yeah. last thing, because you 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 mentioned Please. so many beautiful words of wisdom, um, is there any kind of final um, advice you would give to somebody that has this kind of, you know, draw into this side of the industry of how to sort of move forward with that ambition? Number one, make sure it's your passion. If, if it's not your passion, find something else. Life mm. is way too short. How, how, how do you know if something's your passion? Because you love to do it. You right. get up every morning excited to go into work, to go in and work on your projects. It, it's important for you to have a, a goal in life. And that's what I had. I, I had a goal in life that I wanted to do. And there were ups and downs. There were hardships. There were, there were ups. You know, glorious times. Uh, but but I still kept true to myself and what I wanted to do. And I love it. And I still love it today. That's beautiful, Matthew. It's been such an honor to share this time with you. I'm definitely going to be keeping in touch. Yeah. Um, and I, I I can't wait to chat with you again, sir. I'd loved it. I'd love right. it. Love it. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Oh, Thanks thank for you. Me. And thank you to everybody listening, watching. Be good, be safe, and we will talk soon. Thank you.